Hi everybody, Mrs. Singerly here. We're gonna continue learning about cells and their organelles. Um, at the last um, lecture, we were starting to talk about energy converting organelles. We talked all about the mitochondria. So we're gonna to start today with the chloroplast. So the chloroplast is another energy converting organelle. It is using sunlight or solar energy in converting it into chemical energy. And I know sometimes we don't think about glucose as a chemical, but it is, it's a chemical. And so we're taking sunlight energy and we're converting that into chemical energy. Sometimes it also says we're taking inorganic molecules and we're using it to make something that is organic. And the process the chloroplasts do to synthesize molecules such as glucose is photosynthesis. Now this chloroplast organelle is something that's is membrane bound. So it's gonna be found in eukaryotic cells but only things like plants and algae. So things like um, plants or some protists, algae is considered a protist. And so there are these little green jelly beans that you see floating around in these Elodea cells or Elodea cells. Um, and so they look like these little green jelly beans and they're little, um, you know, um, light absorbing jelly beans. And we're gonna talk more about their structure here in a second. Now, chloroplasts are in a class of plant structures, which are referred to as plastids. And chloroplasts are the ones that, you know, we're gonna reference the most, and it's the one that you really need to know. But there are other, there are other plastids like amyloplasts, and it gives us just another chance to review or to revise. And um, amyloplasts are a type of plastid that stores starch in roots and tubers. And why is it called, so that'd be like a like potato. Um, so why would it be called an amyloplast? Well, remember that starch is made out of amylose and amylopect amylopectin. And so these amyloplasts are storing those, those polysaccharides. Um, there's also what we call chromoplasts. Chromoplasts are plastids that store pigments for fruits and flowers. So that might be what is kind of storing some of the pigment that you see here in a carrot. And of course, the one that we're most familiar with in plants and algae are those chloroplasts, and they contain the pigment chlorophyll, which absorbs sunlight for the process of photosynthesis. So let's talk about its structure. It's also made out of two membranes. So it's got an outer membrane and an inner membrane. It's also going to have fluid, so like a gusher again. And inside of that fluid is going to be circular DNA. Wait a second, chloroplasts have their own DNA? Yes, they do. And it's circular. Hmm, who else has circular DNA? Talk about that more in a second. They have their own ribosomes. And there are 70S ribosomes. Hmm, who else has 70S ribosomes? and has their own enzymes. Hmm, just kind of put that in your brain. We're gonna talk more about that in a second. Inside us, we have the outer membrane and inner membrane. Inside of the inner membrane, we have the stroma, the gusher fluid that contains the DNA, the ribosomes, and the enzymes. And there's also these discs, and the discs are known as thylakoids. And there are little light absorbing discs that actually contain the pigment chlorophyll. And pigments are proteins. And a stack of those discs are known as grana, right? So they're a stack of those thylakoids. So why do we have all of these small internal sacs? Why do we have all these small discs? It increases the surface area. It's all about increasing the surface area. So there's places for more molecules to move back and forth and more reactions can occur. Now, what does that structure have to do with its function? We have a highly, uh, those thylakoids which have a very high surface area, which allows it to transform a lot of solar energy into chemical energy in the form of things like glucose. And this is an anabolic reaction, which means it's a metabolic pathway that's gonna build molecules. And fun fact, um, the chloroplast, we know that the main goal of it is to make something like sugar, to make glucose, but along those, uh, along the way, along the reactions to kind of make that glucose, there is a small amount of ATP that's made in the photosynthesis reactions. So photosynthesis is going to use ATP, but it's also going to make a small amount of ATP along the way as well. 
Um, and here we have just a very oversimplified comparison thanks to the amoeba sisters. We have our chloroplast saying, I use light energy to make glucose. We have our mitochondria thing and I break it down to make ATP. Um, so that's kind of our general overview. But I do want you to know that the chloroplast can make um, some small amounts of ATP. Chloroplasts, again, they're only found in things like plants and algae, and we would consider them autotrophs. Autotrophs means that they can automatically make their own food, okay? And not like you can make your own food in your house, like they can make like a hamburger or mac and cheese. It means that they can, like, it'd be like if you just walked outside in your backyard right now, stood out in the sun and said, mm, I'm full. That's what we mean by they can make their own food. They can be out there and make their own food through the process of sunlight. And again, these are things like plants and algae. The opposite of an autotroph would be a heterotroph. So that'd be like a human, it would be like the billy goat that you see in the image or even things like fungi where they have to consume or absorb their food. Now, we do know that there are some similarities between mitochondria and chloroplasts when we looked at their structure and their function. Um, they're both energy converting organelles. They both had double membranes. So we know we have a phospholipid bilayer, but now we have two phospholipid bilayers. They're what we know, they're what is known as semi-autonomous organelles, which means that they control a lot of their own functioning but not all. So they can make their own proteins, they can make their own enzymes, they can even reproduce on their own, but they can't survive on their own. So that's why we say they're semi-autonomous. Um, we know that they both have their own circular DNA, they have 70S ribosomes, and they have their own enzymes. And how they divide, they divide through a process called binary fission, which is very similar to how a bacteria divides. And so if you can think of well, what other organisms have 70S ribosomes in circular DNA, hmm, that would be bacteria. And so what inferences can we make from this evidence? We can infer that mitochondria and chloroplasts were once free living bacteria. And scientists do um, think this. They think that mitochondria and chloroplasts are descendants from ancestral prokaryotes based on the evidence that they have DNA like a bacteria, they have ribosomes like a bacteria, they divide like bacteria. And so there's a lot of evidence to back up that hypothesis. And scientists actually have a theory known as the endosymbiotic theory. Endo means in, in symbiosis means relationship. And so endosymbiosis is a specific type of symbiosis or relationship where one organism lives within another. And the theory of endosymbiosis explains the origin of eukaryotic cells. So how we went from ancestral prokaryotes, which were the first living things on our planet, to unicellular eukaryotes. So how did we go from prokaryote to having eukaryotic, eukaryotic cells also. And we think it had to do with endosymbiosis. So endosymbiosis is where one cell is engulfed by another and you see that in the animation. And this would make sense why they have a double membrane. If we have our bacteria, which is our kind of ancestral mitochondria, gets eaten by a larger cell, we would expect it to have a, a double membrane system. And then we would expect it to have other characteristics of prokaryotic cells, like the circular DNA, like the 70S ribosomes, and like the fact that it can divide on its own separately from the cell through a process that's very similar to bacteria known as binary fission. Okay, so really, the only thing that these mitochondria and chloroplasts lack is they just don't have the cell wall, that peptidoglycan cell wall, but otherwise they have all the characteristics of prokaryotes. Now, cell wall. The cell wall is a strong, rigid structure. It is found surrounding the cell membrane and it provides structure and support. And we know in plants that it's made out of cellulose, right? And cellulose is a polysaccharide. Now, quick revision moment. Cellulose is made out of what type of glucose? Do you remember? 
The answer is beta glucose. So cellulose is a polysaccharide made out of beta glucose. And remember, when you have a string of the beta glucose, can it just be in a string of kind of repeating beta glucose molecules? Or does every other beta glucose have to be upside down in order to, find, order to have that glycosidic linkage? It's the second one. Every other one has to be kind of upside down in order to form the glycosidic linkage, which means then that our cellulose polysaccharides can hydrogen bond to other cellulose polysaccharides, forming this nice rigid structure, the cell wall. All right, so in plants, it's made out of cellulose. In bacteria, a bacteria cell wall is made out of something called peptidoglycan. Um, we've learned in our carbohydrates unit too that fungi, like mushrooms, their cell wall is made out of polysaccharide known as chitin. And um, there are some protists that have a cell wall, um, but we're not gonna kind of get into it in this unit and what types of cell walls they have. But there, so, so far we've got bacteria have a cell wall, um, some protists can have a cell wall, fungi have a cell wall made out of chitin, plants have a cell wall made out of cellulose, the last one is animals. Animals, 100%, we don't have a cell wall. We only have the cell membrane. Now remember, when we're talking about bacteria and plants having that cell wall, they also have a cell membrane. The cell wall is just kind of going in addition to the cell membrane, okay? Now, with plants, you might be thinking, well, if we have a whole bunch of plants linked together, how do materials get from one cell to the other? They get there through something called plasmodesmata. It's like hakuna matata, what is it? Hakuna matata, right? Plasmodesmata. It's a fun word to say. Um, and so these are channels um, in the cell wall and it's how plant cells are linked to neighboring cells. It allows the cytoplasm Right, which includes water and solutes and proteins to pass freely from cell to cell. And so you can kind of see these pathways through the cytoplasm, through that plasmodesmata to the other cell. And here, if we kind of look at a diagram of the plant cell, you can see these channels in the cell wall. And those channels are the plasmodesmata. Next up is the cytoskeleton. The cytoskeleton is an internal skeleton which helps plants to organize cell structures and activities. And the cell structure, which you can see, it's got, um, there's been some fluorescent dye added to this microscope image, um, is this network that's made out of these different protein fibers. And the cytoskeleton is found in eukaryotic cells. Um, and we're gonna talk about the types of cytoskeleton that are found specifically in eukaryotic cells. Some prokaryotic cells also have a type of cytoskeleton as well, um, slightly different functions. So we're gonna focus mostly on eukaryotic cytoskeleton. So it's made out of these different protein fibers to provide structural support. So maintain the shape of the cell, can even anchor some organelles down. Um, motility, so we're gonna learn about things like cilia, which are these little hairs, and flagella, which is a tail that can whip, that can aid in locomotion, movement. And it can also be dismantled in one part and reassembled in another to help the cell change shape. So amoebas, how they move, they have these things called pseudopods or false feet that can actually reach out and it kind of helps it move. It can actually help it grab organisms like paramecium that's maybe it's trying to consume. Um, and so the cytoskeleton is gonna be a part of that as well. And possibly my favorite is gonna be a type of cytoskeleton here, which is made out of tubulin that these motor proteins can walk on to move, you know, organelles from one side of the cell to another. So you do need to know the different types of cytoskeleton that we would find in a eukaryotic cell. And the first one is gonna be the thinnest and is made out of a protein known as actin. So these are called microfilaments. And that's easy to remember, micro is the thinnest. And it's made out of a protein called actin. And it enables the cell to change shape and move. Okay, so we have these really thin actin microfilaments. So actin is just the type of protein and it's a microfilament, so it's the thinnest and it's helping the cell to kind of change shape and move. Actin is also found in our muscle cells and it's kind of part of what makes our, kind of our muscles contract as well. 
The next one is the intermediate. This one's the middle size. So this is nice and easy to remember because the intermediate is in the middle. And this helps reinforce the cell, so give the cell some structural support with a permanent framework, and it can anchor organelles. So the middle size can kind of reinforce the cell and anchor down some organelles. And the tubulin microtubules, this is the largest. And then these are the ones that we're probably going to reference the most throughout the course. Um, so I would say that the tubulin microtubules are one of the most important ones to know. These are also going to anchor organelles and it can act as tracks for those organelles to move on. And they're also used a lot in cell division. So these are our tubulin microtubules and they are the largest. And you'll notice they actually look like tubes. Um, they're a long, thick, hollow tube. They're made out of a protein that's known as tubulin. And how they form is there's basically two forms of tubulin combined to form a, a dimer. A dimer is a word that means double molecule. So basically we have got two molecules of this tubulin. They come together and they form a dimer. So you can see here are kind of our dimers. There are these two things of, um, of tubulin. Um, and so if we add them on, it can be used to make our tubulin like filament like longer um, and we can kind of break them apart um, to kind of have it retract back. And so here's a picture where we can see here the micro filaments. These are the thinnest, right? And these are what's going to kind of allow the cell to change shape our intermediate filaments, which are a little bit more fibrous, that are gonna give structural support and anchor organelles. And then here's our microtubules that are made out of tubulin that are gonna anchor some organelles down, provide tracks for those motor proteins to walk on, and they're really gonna be highly used in cell division. Here's another image. So we're kind of looking at a cell and you can see all of these different kinds of cytoskeleton in here. We have the microtubules, which are the hollow tubes. Those are the largest, made out of what? It's made out of tubulin. We have the microfilaments, micro, so it's the thinnest, right? And what are those gonna be made out of? They're made out of a protein called actin, good. And then we have our intermediate filaments, and those are really gonna be just providing structural support and anchoring our organelles down. Now, we have locomotive organelles, so things like cilia. These are short hair-like structures that can be found on the cell surface. Some protists, these little unicellular organisms that are eukaryotic, can move this, help like have the cilia for movement for them to actually move around. Um, but we have cilia on some of our cells as well. Um, on our nose cells, we have some cilia, and on our lung cells, we have cilia and what they're doing is in our nose and in our lungs is they're moving substances over the cell, kind of keeping debris and things like that out. Um, smoking will actually burn the cilia off of your lung cells. And it's just one of the many reasons that smoking is bad. Um, and then flagella is the long hair-like structure that you would see on maybe like a sperm cell um, that's also used um, for movement. And the flagella we might see on sperm cells, euglena, which is a protist, and some bacteria cells. And what's driving the cilia moving and what's driving the flagella tail is those microtubules that are made out of tubulin, the kind of largest part of our cytoskeleton. It's those molecules that are actually driving that, the whipping action and the movement of those. Now, we're gonna see microtubules again, the tubulin microtubules, um, because that's what causes cell division to happen. So if we take first a look at this cell diagram and this cell dividing, those things that look like spider webs that are reaching out and grabbing onto the chromosomes and helping to pull them apart and for the cell to divide and actually divide up its genetic material, those spider webs are microtubules and they are made in a microtubule organizing centers known as centrioles. Centrioles are going to help with cell division, which is mitosis, and we're going to cover that in depth in another unit. And during cell division, whether that be mitosis where we're making more body cells or meiosis where we're making sex cells like egg cells and gametes, these 
centrioles are going to make microtubules that are going to guide chromosomes within the cell. Now these centrioles are only something that is found in animal cells in an area known as the centrosome. Okay, good. All right, now we're going to do a brief review here of kind of all the things that we have learned, right? So what cell structure regulates what enters and leaves the cell can recognize singles. Um, signals. That's our cell membrane. That's found in all cells. What's the watery, goopery interior where chemical reactions can happen? That's the cytoplasm. That's found in all cells. The control center, that's the nucleus. Is that found in all cells? DNA is found in all cells, but do all cells have a nucleus? Nope. This is something that's only going to be found in eukaryotic cells like animals and plants. Strong rigid structure that can be found surrounding the cell membrane. That's the cell wall. So who has a cell wall? That's going to be something that's only found in bacteria cells, in plants. We could even put fungi in there, but for this unit we tend to be kind of focused on bacteria and plant and animal cells. The cell powerhouse. That's the mitochondria that's only found in eukaryotes like plants and animal cells. Vacuoles, right? That's something that's membrane bound, only found in eukaryotes like plants and animals. We want to remember that plants are going to have a large kind of permanent vacuole and animals are going to have many small vacuoles. Next up is a lysosome, another membrane bound organelle that contains digestive enzymes. So that's only going to be found in eukaryotes like plants and animals. A peroxisome, which I don't have on there, is also filled with digestive enzymes, also only found in eukaryotes. All right, what is this a picture of down here? What cell structure is this? That's a picture of the rough ER. And so the endoplasmic reticulum, it's membrane bound as part of the endomembrane system, only found in eukaryotes like plants and animals. We want to know the differences between rough and smooth. Ribosomes, where proteins are made, that's something that's found in all cells. Remember that bacteria have 70S ribosomes and eukaryotic cells have 80S ribosomes. The Golgi body, right? Notice what it looks like. It's going to look like that flattened stack of pita bread. It's the UPS center. It's where things are modified, finished, and getting ready for shipment. It's membrane bound, only found in eukaryotic cells. Next up, that's a picture of the chloroplast. It looks like a jelly bean with squares. That's where photosynthesis is going to happen. Those thylakoids contain the chlorophyll. This is only going to be found in plants and algae, autotrophs only. What about this one? The ones, so centrioles, they look like penny pasta that's kind of crossed. Um, those are centrioles. They're going to be kind of our, our microtubule organizing center, and that's going to be something that's only found in animal cells. All right, what, are, what is this a picture of? This is a picture of cilia. Cilia are going to be found in animal cells, um, can also be found in some protocells um, to aid in movement or to move substances over the cell. This long tail is a flagella, and that can be found in some animals and some bacteria cells. What's found inside of the nucleus? What was that one called? The nucleolus. Good, and that's going to be eukaryotic only. And the last one, the internal skeleton, the cytoskeleton, technically that's found in all cells, but we really just need to know the kinds and types that are found in eukaryotic cells that we went over in this presentation. So I want to talk about now, this is a test yourself section, um, but I want to talk about some differences between multicellular and unicellular organisms because for us, we have organs that do life functions. But for a unicellular organism, they don't have organs. So how do they do their life functions? Now it's gonna come down to the organelles and I wanna make some comparisons here. So in a human, like what separates us from our environment, it's our skin. But for a unicellular organism, it would be their cell membrane. That's what's separating um, them from their environment. For us, what helps us move from place to place? What makes our legs move? 
No, those are our muscles and our bones. For a unicellular organism, that would be things like the cilia or the flagella. What, for us, what coordinates and controls activities? Our brain. What's the brain of the cell? That would be the nucleus. Um, for us, what removes waste? Well, that's our excretory system. For a unicellular, where do the wastes leave? They leave through the cell membrane. For us, what, you know, what takes in oxygen and gets rid of carbon dioxide? Those are going to be our lungs, our respiratory system. For the unicellular, again, it's going to be the cell membrane. That's where gases come in and out. So you can really see how the cell membrane is separating it from its environment. It's how wastes are removed. It's how gases are exchanged. Incredibly important for a cell. And lastly, the breakdown of nutrients for us, that would be our digestive system. And for a unicellular organism, that would be, say, the lysosome. And remember that our cells, especially in a multicellular organism, different cells are going to look and act different because they're specialized. And so because of that, they might have more of a certain organelle or different organelles in other cells. And like, I don't know if you guys can remember, what, what organelle would be present in high quantities in muscle cells? Good, it would be something like the mitochondria. So I want to do just a quick review to wrap up this presentation here. What is X pointing to? It's pointing to those little black dots. What are those little black dots? Good. That's a ribosome that it's pointing to. Good. Next question. Which one of these cells is a plant cell? Cell A. Good. Cell A is a plant cell. Notice in my plant cell, here is kind of my large, you know, permanent vacuole. And then it has these black jelly beans that are going around towards the outside. Those would be like chloroplasts. And even though it might not necessarily be clear that they're chloroplasts, the chloroplasts do tend to hang out towards the outer edges of the cell because they're trying to get closer to the sunlight. All right. What is X pointing to here in my animal cell? It's a mitochondria. Good. It's going to look like a jelly bean with squiggles because of that highly folded inner membrane. All right. Let's take a look here at another animal cell. What's one pointing to? Good. The ribosome is pointing to those little black dots. What about two? Nucleolus. Good. That's the structure that's making ribosomes. Number three. Mitochondria, excellent. And number four, so it's pointing towards the structure that has the black dots on it. Good, rough ER, excellent. And there isn't a number pointing to this, but what do you think this is right here? What do you think that is? That's a Golgi body, excellent. All right, so here's kind of a, a looking at a plant cell here. I want you to look at structure C and structure H. And I want you to try to figure out which one's the cell wall, which one's the cell membrane. What do you think? Which one's the cell membrane, C or H? H, good. H is the cell membrane. What would be the cell wall? Good. It would be C. Excellent. Um, what's F pointing to? The central vacuole. Good. What's D pointing to? Golgi body. Excellent, good. Here's a look at an animal cell. We're gonna kind of go through these. So D is pointing to the cell membrane, good. T is pointing to the mitochondria. A is pointing to the, we could say nucleus. And if we wanted to be more specific, we could say the nuclear membrane or the nuclear envelope. P, what's P pointing to? Well, P is pointing to our genetic material. So we might say DNA. You could also say chromatin. What about X? X is pointing to this whole thing here that has these dots on it. So X would be pointing at the rough ER. Excellent. And then M is pointing to the dots, the dots that are found out here in the cytoplasm and the dots that are on here. So M would be pointing at the ribosomes. Remember that free ribosomes are gonna be making proteins that are gonna stay within the cell. Bound ribosomes are gonna be making proteins that are gonna be exported out of the cell. What's U pointing to? 
you is most likely pointing at a vacuole. Um, and there's a couple of these throughout the cell, sorry. Um, it could, I mean, because vacuoles and, um, and lysosomes look very similar. I would say most likely vacuole because it's not showing me any enzymes in there. All right, and what's C pointing to? That's pointing to our Golgi body. Excellent. And then V is just kind of pointing into the watery material, which is our cytoplasm. Now notice there isn't a letter pointing to this. X is pointing to our rough ER. What if we had another letter pointing to this part? this part that doesn't have any dots on it. That would be our smooth ER. Excellent. All right, so that's where we're gonna end our lesson today. I hope that this was helpful and we'll see you back here tomorrow when we start learning about why cells are small and we're gonna do a virtual lab. All right, great.